How do you connect with nature? I'm Jenna Ellett. And I'm Larry Stevens. We are naturalists at the Chattahoochee Nature Center in Roswell, Georgia, 127 acres on the Chattahoochee River. At the Chattahoochee Nature Center, it's our passion, our driving mission to connect people with, people with nature. And to do so, we've brought two of our animal ambassadors who are crucial to helping us achieve this goal. Yeah. When have you seen one of these? Maybe this morning as you were coming in, you saw one on a post next to the road on an open field, maybe over some open water, or you may not have noticed, but it was there. This is a red-tailed hawk of the genus Budio. It's one of the most successful birds of prey in North America. They vary their diet based on what's locally available. You might see them hunting small mammals like rodents. Uh, they might go after snakes, or in the Southwest United States, you might even see one catch a bat mid-flight. Typically, like most raptors, red-tailed hawk females are larger than males, so their diet may also vary upon that as well. And to be successful hunters, they have to have a number of special adaptations, primary one being those wonderful eyes, their most dominant sensory organ. They can see 10 times better than we can. They can see all the colors in the spectrum that we can. They also see colors in the ultraviolet spectrum. They have two foveae in, in each eye near the where the um, light receptors um, are most uh, located, and uh, which gives basically like four eyes. They can see forward and they can see to the side. Okay. Some people are say they look like kind of mean and scary. Pardon the anthropomorphism, but uh, that's due to the fact that they have this well-defined eyebrow called a supraorbital ridge, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that serves a wonderful function. It helps them protect their eye when they're moving through debris like leaves and branches when they're hunting. Also from a struggling prey. It also serves the same thing as a... Um, as a ball cap, it blocks, it shades their eyes from the sun so they can have a better view looking for their prey. Red-tailed hawks are amazing flyers. They spend much of their time in the air. Their broad wings and distinctive red tail are perfectly designed for catching thermals soaring in circles high in the sky. While they're perfectly capable of hunting from the sky, uh, you might also see one perched for hours in a single spot waiting for their prey to ambush. When diving down to catch their prey, they're capable of reaching speeds of 100 to 120 miles per hour. I forgot to also mention the fact that their brains have more, been more highly evolved at, um, at um, processing images. So when we drive along, we'll have a kind of a blur of woods and buildings and fences. And when they're racing along, they're going to be able to pick out the detail on each tree, each bush, each fence post, which is uh, as they're racing along, which is a, a useful thing when you're trying to be on the lookout for small prey. All right, so as they come in, they're going to be grabbing take those wonderful talons. I'm not going to touch you. It's okay. <laughs> those wonderful talons that have been perfectly designed for grasping and piercing and killing their prey. Now, a hawk has um, a grip strength of 200 pounds per square inch. Whereas we, the typical adult, adult around 25 years old, has a, a grip strength of between 25 and at most 60 uh, pounds per square inch. So that's pretty fierce, right? I mean, good. All these adaptations help them to survive. And as Jenna mentioned, they're found throughout North America. So they're very, very successful. And when their courtship is, they do a spectacular aerial uh, courtship dance. And sometimes the male and the female will grab hold of each other's hand, uh, hands, feet, <laughs> and, and go skipping lightly. No. <laughs> so, so, They'll grab their feet, and they'll grab the feet, and then they will spiral and plummet down. They do not hit the ground. They let go before they hit the ground. All right. Um, 
What else? I'm going to check myself here. Oh, another fun fact. Okay. Well, they also, they'll, they'll make their nest between January and April. They lay two or three eggs, the male and the female work together. Um, and then when they hatch, the, um, the females remain with the uh, nest and the babies, keeping them warm and also protecting them from predators uh, while the male goes out and hunts. All right. And another fun fact is, if you've ever seen a movie and it shows a bald eagle soaring majestically and going, scree! Guess what? That's the call of the red-tailed hawk. Okay, the bald eagle's call is kind of a high-pitched tittering, and uh, reportedly in Hollywood, when they went from silent film to talkies, they didn't think the bald eagle's call was macho enough. So, okay, so, all right. So, speaking of silence, do you hear that? Silence. Silence is key for our next animal ambassador, the barred owl of the Strix genus. Like the red-tailed hawk, they're found all across North America. They're more common in the eastern uh, part of the United States, but their range is expanding all the way to the Pacific Northwest. Now, silence is key. A special adaptation that owls have is called silent flight. Silent flight not only allows them to sneak up on their prey, but they can also hear their prey while they're flying. And to be able to hear a mouse scurrying along the forest floor, you've got to have some pretty remarkable hearing. In fact, their entire heads are designed for listening, which might be why they're often associated with uh, wisdom in a lot of folk tales. Their, their feathers are specially designed. They're stiff and form curved walls that channel sound to their ears. Some species of owls, like the barn owl, not to be mistaken with our barred owl here, I know the names are, are quite similar, <laughs> um, have asymmetrical ears. So that particular species has an ear flap that's pointed upward to capture sounds from above and an ear flap pointing downward to capture sounds from below. So the difference in volume between their two ears helps determine the height that the sound is coming from. That, along with the uh, what might look a little silly to us, the bobbing head motion, uh, helps them triangulate the precise location that the sound is coming from. Overall, owl's earring is 10 times more sensitive than ours. And their large wing, relative to their, their smaller body mass, makes it easier for them to lift off and to fly slowly and gracefully uh, with fewer wing beats, which of course preserves, conserves energy. Now their wings on the leading edge, the feathers on the leading edge of, uh, of their feathers, it's, it's um, serrated or combed. And this helps um, control the airflow, which reduces noise. Also on the up, upper surface of their wings, it's a velvety covering, which reduces and deadens sound as their feathers cross each other. And then there's a, on, their, on the trailing edge of their uh, wings, of their feathers, uh, is, is more of a fringe. And uh, all of it perfectly designed for silent flight. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps what people are most drawn to are their eyes. Their eyes are so large in order to take in as much light as possible so that they can hunt even after the sun sets. Their eyes are so large, in fact, that they make up 5% of their total body weight. This percentage might not seem very large at first, but the, put that in co to compare to our own eyes, our eyes make up about 0.0003% of our total body weight. The problem is getting those big eyes in the relatively small skulls of the bird here. They do not have eyeballs. They have elongated eyes, and those are set in a bony uh, cylinder called a sclerotic ring that holds the eye in place. But that prevents them from being able to look up, look down, look left, look right like we do. But they compensate for that by being able to turn their head 270 degrees in either direction. Okay. They're able to do that because they have 14 vertebrae in their neck, whereas we have seven vertebrae in our neck. So they're able to turn their head 270 degrees. They're not able to turn their head all the way around, as some people might have you believe. But 270 degrees is pretty good, too. So. Still pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and they're also zygodactyl, which means they have four toes, this owls, and they, they can keep three of them in the front and one in the back, so they can, for perching, 
But when they're catching prey, they can have two here and two here, which makes them get some better grip on their prey. Another cool adaptation. Today, we've introduced you to two birds of prey uh, who have perfectly evolved to be apex predators that you can find in your own backyard. Now, you might be wondering why we have these owls at the Chattahoochee Nature Center and hawks. Um, <laughs> so not only do we do outreach programs like this, we have a fully licensed wildlife rehabilitation center with wonderful staff and volunteers who are licensed to rehabilitate uh, raptors, birds of prey like these, uh, reptiles, and amphibians. In 2021, our wildlife department provided care for over 750 injured animals. They also fielded over 3,000 phone calls regarding animal injuries. The ultimate goal is to provide them with the care that they need and to get them released back into the wild. Sometimes this isn't possible. The injury might be too great, they might not be able to fend for themselves or hunt properly, or they might be too accustomed to humans to be released. The red-tailed hawk and the barred owl here are just two examples of animals that are non-releasable, so they've be become animal ambassadors, helping us to connect people with nature. Yeah. As our red-tailed hawk in particular, she was captured, caught when she was very, very young and still in the nest and Im imprinted, exactly, um, and, and, and then raised by humans. And that's against the law in Georgia to have a native animal without a permit. So, uh, and, and but she became imprinted and she became dependent on human beings for her well-being. So she is non-releasable. And while she is 32 years old, she, uh, and, and you can tell, she gets, she gets well taken care of. She gets housed, she gets fed regularly, and she's a prima donna. Uh, so, so, and we are her servants. As for the barred owl, she was down the Altamaha River hunting one night and flew near a tree where some fisherman had gotten his hook caught in the limbs and just cut the monofilament line. She caught it in her right shoulder and her struggles to try to free herself. She got the monofilament lines tied around, so she permanently damaged her right uh, right wings. So she, she is non-releasable. Yeah, I see, that's right. yep, yep. Two, two separate cases, two, two very different ways people can have a negative impact on our wildlife. At the Chattahoochee Nature Center, not only do we rehabilitate wildlife and do outreach programs, we also offer a variety of educational programs as well. Annually, we see up to 44,000 Metro Atlanta students who come visit the Nature Center. In addition to that, we have thousands of uh, general admission guests and members who visit the Nature Center. Many of these children and even adults have never seen these animals up close and personal. It's our hope that they'll build a connection and they'll realize that they share the wild, you know, the real world, with some pretty amazing animals. And we hope that that leads to them making positive changes around them. Right. And I believe the theme for this week, uh, this weekend is, um, is that, can we do that here? Well, in around the mid-1970s, a group of people said, can we build a nature center that will have this kind of impact? And by George, it happened. <laughs> Good. All righty. So, um, but threats to our raptors. Well, of course, there's habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation. Um, Apparently, the, like the red-tailed hawk, they will have smaller clutches of eggs. They'll just have one because they have less prey. For these two, they're pretty well in adapting to the urbanization. I live in Buckhead in Atlanta. I got a pair of these uh, living by nearby uh, here in the hoo 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 hoo. <laughs> so, um, but um, with habitat destruction, habitat arrest, uh, fragmentation is is having a greater impact on on wildlife general in general. Um, all right, hunting. Another one of our raptors a threat to them is uh, is hunting. And of course, it's against the law to kill a raptor. And if I catch you, I'm going to turn you in. Okay. Other thing is. Rodent poisoning. All right, people put their poison their rats or whatever, and then that the predators will catch that poisoned rodent and in turn be poisoned. So it's not just our birds, but other rat, other other predators. Um, 
thing to do there is just to see why do you have the rodents? Is there access to food? Um, is there ways to prevent them coming in? Or are there more humane ways to trap them and have them removed? In most cases, you can do without the poison. Another easy fix is to clean up after ourselves. If you're doing a little more fishing than catching and you get your line tangled in a tree, be sure to take it down. Another easy thing to do is to not throw food or anything for that matter out of your car window. Even small amounts of food can attract animals like rodents, which then attracts the birds of prey that we've met today. They don't know to look both ways when they're crossing the street, flying down to uh, ambush their prey. In fact, this year, about 26% of the cases brought to our wildlife department have involved vehicle collisions. This small fix can save countless birds. Okay. Well, in conclusion, we want to encourage you to get outside and meet the other participants in the habitat that you share with them. For example, whenever you go out or when, wherever you go out, hone four of your five basic senses. All righty. Use your eyes, keep your eye on the sky for, for birds like this magnificent one, um, but also look for small wonders, okay? And keep, attune your ears to the sounds around you, like the barred owl call. And, and hey, right, the wind makes different sounds depending on the kind of vegetation it blows through, so just listen carefully. Put those olfactory nerves to work, smell the world. Good stuff, okay, and, 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 Get in touch with nature, literally, all right? T trees bark, straws, fur, feathers, soil, water. So get out and enjoy. But for your taste sense, leave that at home or in restaurants, uh, unless you're more advanced in your embrace of nature than most folks are, okay? <laughs> and we do invite you to come to the Chattahoochee Nature Center, please, during normal operating hours. And... Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, come, come canoe on the Chattahoochee River with our guides. Take on the zip line and canopy challenge. Uh, walk our trails. Meet more of our non-releasable animals. Uh, we've even got two bald eagles. You might even get to hear them do their high-pitched titter. Uh, so, and uh, so, anything else? Thank you all so much. We've Thank enjoyed you. being here.